Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Become a supporter of American Catholic History at American Catholic History dot locals dot com or Patreon dot com slash American Catholic History. We've got some great perks for supporters, including interviews, gifts, live discussions, and even items we pick up on our travels, like our pilgrimage to Santa Fe later in June. Still time to sign up. For information, visit our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Help us keep this going. Also, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a great review at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. These help others to find us. Today, Memorial Day, we're talking about Andre Caillou, one of the most significant officers of the Civil War that almost no one knows about. He was among the first black men commissioned an officer in the Union Army, and his regiment, the 1st Louisiana Native Guard, was the first all-black regiment mustered into the Union Army. But his life and death have some interesting elements that we just can't fully understand from where we are here in the 21st century. Right, because he was born a slave in 1825, received his freedom at 21 years old, became an established businessman and pillar of the community, and then, interestingly, signed up to fight for the Confederacy when the Civil War broke out. Yeah, this is the most unexpected part. We'll talk about that a bit and how it wasn't unexpected to him. But one thing that is clear, from soon after his death and for many years, he was one of the most revered Black Americans. One Civil War veteran who was interviewed in 1890 said, If ever patriotic heroism deserved to be honored in stately marble or in brass, that of Captain Caillou deserves to be. And the American people will have never redeemed their gratitude to genuine patriotism until that debt is paid. So, who was this remarkable man? Let's tell his story. Good idea. Andre Caillou was born a slave on August 25th, 1825 on the plantation of the Duvernay family in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. Plaquemines is the parish, or county, as that's what they call counties, of course, just down the Mississippi River from New Orleans. His master, Joseph Duvernay, was Catholic, and he made sure his slaves had access to the sacraments and religious education. So Caillou grew up Catholic, and he knew his faith. In fact, when he was baptized in 1827, it took place in the Cathedral of St. Louis in New Orleans. So while he was a slave, the son of slaves, his entry into the faith was as remarkable as anyone else's. In 1828, after his master, Joseph Duvernay, died, he and his parents moved to New Orleans where their new master, Joseph's sister, Amy, lived with her husband. Andre learned the cigar-making trade as he grew and became pretty good at it. In 1846, his master and her husband offered a petition to grant him manumission, which was the formal legal process by which a slave became a free man. She did so out of gratitude for how excellent a servant he had been and how well she regarded him. In her petition, she assured the court that through his good personality, strength of character, and industrious abilities, he would have an excellent chance of being a contributing member of society. An all-white police court in New Orleans granted the petition and he was able to leave servitude and become a member of the Jeans de Couleur Libre, or Free People of Color. In June of 1847, he married another recently manumitted slave, Felice Coulon, and adopted her son as his own. Andre and Felicie had four more children together. The Cayuse quickly became part of the flourishing community of free people of color in New Orleans, about 11,000 of them. And this was part of the oddity of life in New Orleans before the Civil War. In New Orleans, there were the whites who held all the power and controlled most everything. Then you had the slaves who were considered property and they controlled nothing. Then there was this third class in between, the free people of color. They could own property, enter contracts, and testify in court, but they were denied the vote, so they had no political power. But they could own businesses, get educated, and advance in society according to their abilities, so most of them lived a fairly comfortable existence. Some did very well for themselves. They could also own slaves, and some did. Sometimes it was for economic reasons, but sometimes it was to keep families together. The Cayuse did not own slaves, and they were not wealthy, but they did live comfortably. 
Another member of this free people of color whom we talked about before was Venerable Henriette de Lille. She was an octroon, so one-eighth black, who refused to officially identify as white as some of her siblings did. Delille escaped from the Plassage system and established the Sisters of the Holy Family. We told her story way back in episode 13. Yes, Delille was very fair-skinned since she was only one-eighth African. Andre Caillou, by contrast, was 100% of African descent, and he boasted proudly that he was the blackest man in New Orleans. By the mid-1850s, Andre was among the most respected members of the free people of color. He was an excellent athlete, a good horseman, and one of the better boxers. He had established a successful cigar-making business, and he was elected to the leadership of one of the mutual aid societies, the Friends of Order. Also, like so many of the free people of color, he was devotedly Catholic. Yes, he had his children baptized and sent his two sons to be educated at the Institut Catholique, which he also supported with financial contributions. When the Civil War broke out in April of 1861, the governor of Louisiana requested that the mutual aid societies form a militia regiment called the Defenders of the Native Land, or the Louisiana Native Guards Regiment. Most of them responded to the call more out of fear of reprisals, if they didn't, than out of a desire to defend the Confederacy. Some also hoped that should the Confederacy prevail, their own positions in society would be improved if they responded favorably to this request. The Louisiana officials, however, really only intended the Louisiana Native Guard Regiment to be for show and not an actual fighting force. And this played out. The Native Guards weren't issued uniforms, and they certainly weren't given guns. They took part in parades, but not much more. The Friends of Order did their part, and Andre Caillou was commissioned a first lieutenant in the Native Guards. But the Native Guards only lasted for a short time. When the Confederate troops abandoned New Orleans to Union occupiers in 1862, the Native Guards ceased to be. The head of the Union occupation was General Benjamin Butler. Butler had a few run-ins with prominent Catholic individuals. We talked about one famous one in our very first episode about Margaret Hari, the breadwoman of New Orleans. One of your favorite stories. Absolutely. She was incredible. In this case, Butler faced food shortages in the city, the strain of enforcing citywide curfews and martial law, and the potential for a Confederate counterattack to retake the city. So he needed more troops. He knew Washington had none to send to him, and he knew the white population in New Orleans wouldn't be keen on supporting the Union cause, so he turned to the free men of color. He actually wrote to Edwin Stanton, a native of Steubenville, asking for more troops, and he knew Stanton wouldn't, re wouldn't reply with a positive answer. So when he was writing to Stanton, he actually said, if you do not send me more troops, I shall turn to Africa meaning, of course, the free men of color. So he authorized raising three regiments. Thus, in August of 1862, these regiments became the first units composed of men of African descent in the Union Army. And though the higher-up officers were white, the officers from the company level down were black. Andre Caillou was commissioned a captain in the Union's 1st Louisiana Native Guard Regiment, making him one of the first black officers in the Union Army, and he managed to raise a company of troops. They mostly consisted of Catholic free men of color, though he welcomed some runaway slaves into the ranks. And though they were now Union soldiers, they still faced a daunting path. Most of the white officers and soldiers among the Union rakes treated the black officers and soldiers very poorly. They looked down on them and heckled them, spit at them. The black troops were mostly relegated to guard duty and manual labor details. When General Butler was replaced by Nathaniel Banks, things got worse. General Banks had a very low opinion of the abilities of black soldiers, and he decided to purge the ranks of their black officers. He managed to eliminate most of the black officers in the 2nd and 3rd regiments, but not the 1st. Caillou retained his position. And then battle necessities put that campaign on hold and gave the black soldiers a chance to prove themselves in battle. Port Hudson was a Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River about 100 miles upriver from New Orleans. It and Vicksburg, even further upriver, were the last remaining Confederate-held ports on the river, and they kept the Confederate lines open to Texas. Without those two ports, the CSA would be bisected and badly damaged. In May of 1863, the Union commanders determined that they must take both Port Hudson and Vicksburg. 
Vicksburg, of course, became the more well-known struggle because of the long siege of General Ulysses S. Grant, but no less important was the attack on and then siege of Port Hudson. The date of the attack was set for May 27th. On that day, the 1st Regiment of the Native Guard, including Cayuse E Company, led the assault on a heavily fortified Confederate emplacement. The men of the 1st Regiment charged bravely, with Captain Cayuse shouting out orders and encouragement in both English and French as they dodged cannonballs, musket fire, canister, and grape shot. The attack was very ill-conceived as the Confederate emplacement was well fortified and the approaches to it were very narrow and offered no cover. But the order was given to charge, and Captain Caillou and his men did so. Caillou and the other officers, I mean, they weren't stupid men. They probably knew it was basically a suicide mission. But they also knew that the white officers, General Banks' chief among them, just expected the black officers and the black soldiers to desert, to complain, to refuse to follow orders, and refuse to fight. They knew this was the expectation, and they also knew that trying to argue against it wouldn't have any result. So, if you've seen the movie Glory, you know what this means. They ended up and kicked in, and they did their duty. They suffered terrible casualties. As he charged, Caillou took a hit from some grape shot, which broke his left arm and left it dangling useless at his side. After stopping the blood, he picked up his sword in his right hand and renewed the charge as best he could. But after a few more charges, he was felled by a cannonball and did not get back up. The remnants of the 1st Regiment were forced to retreat. The attack was abandoned and the Union instead laid siege to Port Hudson. In the ensuing days, the Confederates allowed the Union to recover their dead, their white dead. But Confederate snipers fired upon anyone who attempted to recover the bodies of the black soldiers who had fallen. Now, there is another account which says that the Confederate general offered a truce so General Banks could recover the bodies that fell in that area. But Banks, who never liked the black soldiers anyhow, replied coldly, I have no casualties in that area, and left them there to rot. Yeah. Now, either or both accounts can be true and point to the same thing. Though the war was fought over ending slavery, ultimately, it wasn't because the men of the Union had a virtuous and a truly Christian view on race relations. No, not at all, General Banks. Piece Quite of work. A piece of work. Yeah. yeah. And thus, Andre Caillou's body and those of so many other soldiers remained where they fell for 47 days in the intense dripping heat of the lower Mississippi River Basin in June and July. By the time Port Hudson surrendered and the Union was able to recover the bodies, the vast majority were unidentifiable and were buried in graves marked unknown. The only reason they could identify Captain Caillou was because of a ring around his skeletal finger. It was the ring from his Friends of Order Mutual Aid Society. His body returned to New Orleans to much fanfare in July of 1863, where he lay in state in the Friends of Order Hall with his sword and uniform atop the flag that draped his casket. His funeral mass was a massive affair, held on July 29, 1863. The route along Esplanade Avenue from the church to the Bienville Street Cemetery was lined with thousands of black men who recognized immediately that Caillou was a martyr to the cause of the rights and recognitions that black Americans deserved. The funeral procession was more than one mile long, and it was headed by the brass band of the 42nd Massachusetts Regiment. And this became the first in a common occurrence, the jazz funeral. Nowadays, it is a fairly common thing, but at the time, not so much. This is a fascinating history, and we'll actually link to an article about this. And we should note, the Catholic funeral had its share of very unfortunate controversy. The Archbishop of New Orleans at the time, Jean-Marie Audin, was a Confederate sympathizer, and he forbade his priest from ministering to former slaves. The priest who offered the funeral mass, Father Claude Pascal Maestre, was already on the outs with Archbishop Odin because he had continued ministering to all blacks and agitating for emancipation right on through the war. Yes, he had been a pastor in New Orleans, but after the war began, he was ousted by the bishop. So he established a new parish, not within the auspices of the archdiocese, St. Rose of Lima, where many black Catholics went for mass. That included Caillou and his wife, Felicie. 
This is a story for another time, but Father Maestra was suspended by Archbishop Oden for his actions and wasn't reconciled with the church until after Oden was gone. We'll probably do an episode on Father Maestra because this isn't the only interesting part of his story. No. Odin's position makes no sense to us today, but his rationale included not wanting to rock the boat with the civil authorities and the prevailing culture. He figured that though slavery was bad, it was part of the politics and the culture of the region, so it wasn't good to oppose it too forcibly. And that doesn't sound at all like any issues we're facing today. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, anyhow. More things change, so they say. Plus <laughs> change, however they say that, yeah, French. Anyhow, Father Maestra did the funeral, and André Caillou was laid to rest, a hero of civil rights and a burgeoning cause célèbre. His name became known nationally as Harper's Weekly, the New York Times, and other major publications wrote about him, his regiment, their sacrifice, and his funeral. The Times reporter wrote about the skill and nerve of the black soldiers in the face of such hideous carnage, and wrote that very few white soldiers would have had the nerve enough to encounter such perils, even if ordered to. And the reporter singled out Captain Caillou for a special praise. Their heroism had an impact even on President Lincoln. In 1864, Lincoln reflected on the valor of the 1st Louisiana Regiment in the assault on Port Hudson, as well as that of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, another all-black regiment, and their assault on Fort Wagner in July of 1863. If you've seen the movie Glory, that's who it's about. He wrote about the black Civil War veterans, quote, who have so heroically vindicated their manhood on the battlefield where, in assisting to save the life of the Republic, they have demonstrated in blood their right to the ballot, which is but the humane protection of the flag they have so fearlessly defended. Pretty high praise. Yeah, I'd say so. And along those lines, Caillou's death was felt at the National Negro Convention in Syracuse, New York, in October of 1864. They met to generate greater support for the 13th Amendment and the right of black men to vote. The convention took on a buzz when James Ingraham, the man who had assumed command of E Company after Caillou was killed, walked into the convention hall carrying the tattered flag of E Company, stained with the blood of the brave Caillou. The delegates burst into loud and sustained applause and insisted on hanging the flag over the dais. Their work took on greater urgency and meaning, and out of it came the Equal Rights League, which was instrumental in helping guide the 14th and 15th Amendments through ratification. As we said earlier in the episode, for decades after his death, André Caillou retained a hero's status, especially among Black Americans, for his example, his dedication, and his sacrifice. Knowledge of him and his deeds fell off significantly over the 20th century, especially as the civil rights movement gained so many victories. But there still remains efforts to keep his memory alive. In the wake of the removal of so many statues of Confederate officers, some believe Caillou would be a fitting replacement in certain places. Also, some believe he deserves the Medal of Honor for his conspicuous gallantry in the face of overwhelming odds. Who knows? Maybe either or both of these will happen. And if they do, they will be further affirmation of the greatness of the first black military hero of the Civil War, the devout Catholic, Captain Andre Caillou. This has been American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter on Locals or Patreon. Get information about both and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Andre Caillou, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. And be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media.